Hi, everybody. It's Kevin. And it's Donna. And you're with us on the med list. We've got a super exciting episode today, Donna, but we are kind of right in between going into, I guess, the full on holiday blitz. You know, we've got Christmas. We got some people do Christmas Eve big, too. And then we have New Year's parties happening. What's happening in Donna's life there? Any exciting things? Yeah, well, we have a wedding added on, too, for all of that. So um, my whole family, um, the, my husband, kids, and I, we get to go to a New Year's Eve wedding. So we can't wait. So between the Christmas season and um, and finishing up the season with a wedding, it's going to be wonderful. How uh, about same. you? <laughs> same. You know, we just got back from visiting some family, doing an early holiday party. And, you know, next we're going to be doing lots of traveling you know, kind of hitting every family member's house along the way. Uh, thankfully, we're only like a few hours away from everybody. We don't have to board any planes or anything like that. But we're going to uh, try to connect with all the individuals we care about. And I, our next guest coming on cares about pharmacy in particular. Yeah, you and <laughs> without I, being a pharmacist herself. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll start the episode just in a sec. All right. Um, so I'm going to, no further ado, pass it over to Donna to be able to introduce Suzanne. We were talking off screen and it was so illuminating to hear some of her perspectives, I guess, on a world that a lot of people aren't familiar with, Donna. You know, we see the advertisements on TV. You know, we see the, let's say, middle-aged couple holding hands in two bathtubs. You know, we see the cartoon characters flashing across the screen. And then all of a sudden we realize there are real clinical implications that happen from those advertisements. So mm -hmm. having an expert with over 30 years of experience and plugging in a PhD in here is uh, really a, a blessing for us and hope everybody enjoys. And here's Absolutely. Suzanne for you to introduce, Donna. Yeah. So thank you for joining us, Suzanne. So today we have Suzanne Steiner with us. And um, Kevin, what I was going to say is what I love about our guests is that they've been just so dynamic and multifaceted. And Suzanne is just like that too. So between the whole um, pharma side of um, and her work and, and now with a lot of um, work in the principal consultant to review advertising and promotional materials um, for multiple pharmaceutical companies, that's amazing. But what I absolutely love about Suzanne is how much she advocates for pharmacists. And she's working on her PhD and she's really trying to align pharmacists and empower pharmacists to you know, really use our skills that we have, that we've, um, that we've been able to um, grow with as throughout our experiences and really have us be the folks for de-prescribing. So, um, so welcome, Suzanne. And I just um, so excited to really get into so many levels um, with you today. So could you just very briefly tell us a little bit about yourself and could you just tell us about um, the dissertation that you're also um, working on? Yes, I'd be happy to. Thank you so much, Kevin and Don, for having me on the show. I'm so pleased to be part of this. And I have been working um, in pharma, as you mentioned, for, you know, decades and decades. Uh, I, I might look fabulous, but I'm really old. So, <laughs> 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 but I am, I am a big uh, proponent of pharmacists. I have mentored a lot of pharmacists uh, who have done rotations through the pharma industry, and I always wonder why they want to go into pharma, and that spurred some of my interest in my dissertation topic, which is related to enabling pharmacists to um, be more empowered to offer and recommend deprescribing to those who are on potentially inappropriate medications. And I am not anti-pharma. I've had some feedback that I, I need to be careful what I say because it sounds like I'm anti-pharma. And that is, that I, that's far from where I am because I work on very, very important medications for patients with, you know, who have cancer, who have neurological issues, all kinds of different medications. And people are incredibly dedicated in this, in the pharma industry to make people well who are suffering. The problem is there is really no oversight over the volume of medication that is being prescribed 
And also, of course, there's the prescription cascade where someone takes a medication and then they have side effects. So they are given another medication to deal with the side effects. And that gives more side effects, which creates a need for additional medication. And this prescribing cascade obviously causes a, you know, a multitude of issues. And this is becoming a serious, serious problem because we have what's called the silver tsunami. And that is the technical term, but it's the, you know, the boomers that are becoming over 65. And the, the data show that once you turn 65, you're on an average of five medications. And the data also show once you're over three to four medications, you start becoming confused. Like, wait, when am I supposed to take this? Am I supposed to take this one with food? Wait, no, this one is with food. This one's without food, but this one's in the morning and this one is not, but was I supposed to take that one with food? It just becomes very confusing. And some of that is also due to the medications that are given. There's brain fog, um, you know, with statins quite often. Um, so it, it becomes this multifactorial issue, but the, the bigger issue in my, in my, um, from what I'm seeing is that nobody owns this. Nobody yep. has any real responsibility. You know? And I think pharmacists are not empowered to have the, the ability to really step in. They can make recommendations. Find that out. That they're not federally recognized as healthcare providers. Yeah. You, you said something that I feel like I just wanted to highlight. Like, you said pharmacists are not empowered, right? Like they, they don't feel like they can do what they need to do to own that space. Like when did you first recognize that is the case because your your background wasn't as a pharmacist. So when did you run yeah. into that conundrum and when, when so, did you think it has to change? Yeah, well, what's interesting is, so I, I work in advertising and promotion and I've always asked, why are we not advertising to pharmacists? Like, why are we not bringing this up with pharmacists? Why are we not talking to pharmacists? Why are we not you know, as a large pharma company or even a small pharma company, um, where is the information for the pharmacist? I would ask this question regularly and it would just be like, oh, yeah, we don't need to do that. We don't, you know, it's really the prescriber. And I personally, as a non healthcare practitioner, like I'm not a prescriber, I'm not a pharmacist, I'm not a nurse, I don't know how that system all works. But it was very odd to me. It just was one of those things that I was like, well, I think that's weird. Like, why would you not? Because I see the pharmacist as a patient, a critical patient touch point. Mm -hmm. And so that is a discussion that's been going on um, with myself. <laughs> me, myself, and I have been discussing this <laughs> to the point where I thought, you know what? I really need to go into a doctoral program and figure this out because it, it doesn't make sense. But um, it is, and by the way, I, it's not a PhD, it's a doctorate of business administration. So I just wanna clarify that because people get funny about that and it's impression management, which is something that I also wanna talk about in terms of pharmacists because pharmacists do not call themselves doctors, which really irritates me. And um, in fact, so my, my research that I'm doing, I'm interviewing, um, I'm interviewing different pharmacists from all over the US and I'm at about 21 right now. There was a study done in uh, at the University of Kentucky. They did a survey of pharmacists and the prescribing and what they found were the biggest barriers and facilitators of recommending deprescribing were time, trust and communication. Those three things were like the top three big ones. But what you don't get from that is it was a survey. So you don't really get to get the the person to person contact of why. I mean, those three things make sense. But other things were also in those categories like pay. You know, they're not really paid for it. Well, it's more than that. It's more than just saying, oh, I don't get paid to do that. It's like, well, there are mechanisms to pay for it if you go through Medicare. But when you're getting paid forty dollars an hour, to do a full medication, you know, therapy management review, and you're on the clock to fill thousands of prescriptions. I mean, there's, it's more, it's bigger than that. And so that's where I'm really digging into the data and trying to get that information. 
So yeah. that's great. And I just want to say, I just made myself doc, Dr. Donna Bartlett on the screen. Um, I threw that in as we as you we were speaking. So <laughs> you're already empowering me. So thank you. Well, again, um, <laughs> and, and this is interesting because it, I consistently heard it from every single pharmacist I talked to. I don't call myself doctor because um, I want to have a better connection with my patients. Really? Well, doctors call themselves doctors and they want connections and, you know, relationships with their patients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, I think that's or a, academia yeah. will call me doctor, but I don't use that if I am not in the academic setting. It's like that's not OK, because you really are a doctor in healthcare, And I think it prevents that healthcare practitioner status from being implemented, because mm -hmm. if you're not if you're not out there saying, hey, I'm a doctor of medicine, I am the expert in medicine, which is true. There's nothing wrong with saying that. Yeah. And I think. People don't know that. Like most of my friends do not know that pharmacists are doctors mm. because nobody says it. And right. I think that I don't think that's right. I think I think that's a problem. And I had one pharmacist tell me there's a joke. It's called the you're an O doctor. And it also goes for doctors of optometry and some other things. And she says, yeah, when somebody says, oh, oh, you're a doctor. And you say, yes, I'm a I'm a pharmacist. And they say, oh, you're that kind of doctor. So it's an O doctor. And I thought, well, that I, I understand that that's uncomfortable. But to me, that is still you're letting someone else tell you where you're where you specialize. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. It's fascinating, Suzanne, because I, I feel like for, for me, like with trying to say this with all humility, I fully embrace that compared to all my healthcare brethren. I am leaps and bounds smarter than them when it comes to medications. Like there is nothing close to having the PharmD. But on, on I think the other side of the equation, like we do see physicians assistants and we do see ARNPs very successfully navigate themselves into yeah. doing things that I believe a lot of pharmacists should be doing, but they do not call themselves doctor, right? Either. And so I think there's uh, there's kind of a rock and a hard place there, but when it when but they don't, but they are healthcare providers and you're not. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, I think and that piece, when you mentioned getting paid, go. getting so. paid for your services, your cognitive services and owning those skills and abilities are important. Yep. And they're not just important for the profession. As you're mentioning, they're important for patients. Like there's right. real patient implications by not having these experts as part of their care team in general. Well, for you and your 30 years, Tell me this, when you've really wanted a pharmacist to be in the wings, ready to help your patients from the lens of someone in the pharmaceutical industry, when has that occurred most often, Suzanne? I think when there is complexity around the product and I have, I've, I've written a lot of labels. So, and when I say labels, I'm talking about the package inserts and all that prescribing mm -hmm. information. And that's, that is the Bible of the product. That is the key ingredient to any product. And so, and hardly anyone reads it. I mean, if you're in healthcare, you read it, you're more likely to read it. But like patients, they see that and they're horrified. You know, they're like, well, what, what is this? This is, you know, and even I even have friends who are in the industry and they don't read it and they should know that. And I chastise them, you know, you didn't read the label, <laughs> you know, look at the side effects. Don't come to me. Read. The, I'm going to Google, Googling the prescribing information and reading you what you already have. Like, come on. But um, for me, it's it's really the complex products. And it's also um, I think just any product where there's a contraindication or there's, I mean, I, I just was talking to somebody today about the Holy, the Holy Trinity of having the, um, having a sleep, sleep aid, a muscle relaxant and some type of anti anxiety medication. Yeah. You know, you have those three. Well, one of my neighbors is on it and she couldn't be reached for over 24 hours. Another neighbor of mine was gossiping about it. And then she said, yeah, well, she's on this and this. And I said, well, that's, Part of the Holy Trinity, you can't be on, she can't, she can't be taking that. But why do I know that? Because I've been talking to pharmacists. Had I not been doing this study, I would not have known that. Mm -hmm. I would not have known that. And I think that that's where there's a real lack of 
patient education and connection. And part of that is because of these time limitations, not just on pharmacists, but on patients, because everything is designed to get people out, right? You, yeah, you need to go talk to the pharmacist. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I've, you know, I know what to do. Sure. You know? Yeah. It's or so they don't know what to yeah. ask either. <laughs> or, or my favorite one is, well, my doctor said it was fine. So oh, it's yeah. like, well, your doctor's not the medication expert. Right. Again, right. this is where I think there's that lack of understanding of how serious this is. And I think we take it very lightly in the U.S. especially um, and especially with our advertising and promotion, I've been around so long. <laughs> I remember when we were where it was illegal to have television advertisements. Yeah. It wasn't until the 90s. It was like 96, mm -hmm. 94, 96 when they started allowing uh, DTC advertising on TV. And the U.S. and New Zealand are the only countries in the world that allow it. Right. And it's and there's no advertising allowed towards patients at all in Europe. You can't, there's, there's none of that. Yeah. And it's very price conscious, right? Because it's, it's socialized medicine. So what you have there is the government's like, you are not going to, you know, implement this marketing strategy because we're paying for it. Right. So it's a different right. mindset and yeah. it, it becomes very complex here. Um, one of my favorite, um, images is this image of when they were trying to implement the um the the care act oh, yeah. uh, the Obama the affordable care, care act yeah. yeah yeah affordable care act and it looks like a plate of spaghetti it literally looks like there are so many things mixed in there you cannot trace any of it which is yeah. very concerning because again and that's why this is a a business doctorate that I'm getting because it's financially, it hits all of us financially, every single one of us. Because the biggest group that is affected by this are, are elderly. Mm -hmm. For sure. And yeah. that's, that's why I did the type of study I'm doing because pharmacists and the elderly, unfortunately are both, they are, there's certain issues that, um, that surround people who are oppressed mm -hmm. and pharmacists within healthcare are oppressed and the elderly within our society are oppressed. And so that's, that's the academic answer of why I chose this group. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's a super transformative worldview basically. So, how, so how do we move out of this and um, how, like what, what should we be doing as healthcare providers, whether it is a pharmacist or even a, a non-pharmacist healthcare provider? What right. should everyone be doing in order to, I guess, elevate uh, or I, I don't want to say people don't respect us, but to respect the degree that right. in, in the right. skills that pharmacists have and utilize them in an effective way. Um, so, so Suzanne, are you able to comment on that and say like, this is the, this is at least a starter to the solution? Well, there, there was a very, um, thorough study done in Canada called the deprescribed study, which is by, um, Philip Martin or Philippe Martin, um, you know, French Canadian, who knows? Um, but that study was integral in showcasing the value of pharmacists in supporting deprescribing practices. And it was a very simple change to current process, which was call patients if they're in this, you know, age category and they're on a certain type of medication, there was a list of medications, um, call them and do a quick, you know, uh, number of medications, like do a quick medication review. And the goal was to keep them out of the hospital, right? Because that's the highest cost center. And that had is so successful. They were able to show a huge cost savings, improved patient healthcare outcomes and improvement in patient satisfaction because they felt like there was another contact for them because they weren't looking at the pharmacist as a contact. And I think that's something where, again, it's it's 
I mean, sometimes it is a lack of respect, but I think that's a cultural and societal thing in the U.S. It's not so much overseas um, because they recognize the doctor. And typically overseas, the pharmacist is where you go first, not the doctor. Right. So it's a little different. I think um, the challenges are huge and it would take a massive cultural shift. But I also think there are ways to do that with very simple PSAs, public service announcements that say, did you know your your phar- your local pharmacist is a doctor? If you are concerned about the number of medications you're on, talk to your pharmacist. Now, while I think that's a great idea, I'm also concerned because most people in this country go to huge corporate pharmacies where that is they are not going to have access mm-hmm. to the pharmacist as much as they would like. Um, they still would have a better shot at talking to a pharmacist than they would trying to get a hold of a doctor in a short amount of time. And we know when you have a pharmacist oversight in disease states like chronic diseases like diabetes or chronic heart failure, um, chronic heart disease, things like that, your outcomes are going to improve. Your patients are going to do better because if you have a pharmacist involved, they're going to adjust the medication for the patient much faster than if you have a doctor who doesn't have the time to deal with it. If you have diabetes, you don't get into your endocrinologist for another three months. Once you have your appointment, you do not see them again for three months. Well, if your insulin's off, that's, you know, then you have to go to your doctor. Well, guess who's the expert in insulin? It's not, it's not necessarily the doctor. It's, the pharmacist who has access to all the types of insulin that are available. The fascinating thing in here, Suzanne, is that there are already those models existing. We already have them in the U.S. They're already very successful. They just mm-hmm. don't exist outside of public health. Like we, we have the VA model and we have the IHS right. model that right. elevate the pharmacist to those levels. Uh, they've added on additional layers of clinical expertise. And so I feel like that's the question really revolves around only one thing it's compensation. Like there is no cognitive compensation right. pathway, you know, until we get that to move. And there's been lots of pushes in Congress to say, how can we get this new expert, not new, newly recognized expert mm-hmm. into the pathway? And continually Congress is shutting down those bills or watering them down to avoid think, adding on. Additional I think costs. there's, I know of eight that have been shut down and there's just one that was recently proposed. So I don't know where that stands right now, but um, yeah. yeah eight have at least eight have been have been shut down and it's unfortunate it's very challenging i I agree i don't um i just hope that my research will spark interest in the right person that can support it through the right political um avenues because i think it is a political issue again it's healthcare provider status and it's it's reimbursement for knowledge transfer and again you're the experts in that knowledge there's no better expert about medication than a pharmacist. You know, one weird thing we run into, Suzanne, that I think you could clear up for Don and I is Don and I talk about like prescribing cascades in the terms that you just talked about, that you have one drug, side effect, et cetera. There's another kind of prescribing cascade that comes directly from pharma that I'm hoping that you can tell me more about. It is the okay. tail wagging the dog conundrum in healthcare. <laughs> Advertisement is seen. Patient goes, you know what? That looks like a great drug. It could really help me or my family member. They go to their provider. Their clinician provider could be an MD, ARNP, PA. They say, I want to take this drug. Provider says, well, if they're willing to take it, there's going to be higher volition for them to be compliant to it. I'm going to prescribe it. They send that off to the pharmacist. Pharmacist doesn't have enough time and they're not getting paid to be able to evaluate those things critically. Patient gets drugged. Right. And so unfortunately, now the patient has gotten a drug that maybe they shouldn't have gotten. There's a cheaper drug in general. There's some other kind of conundrum pieces. How do we keep that line from happening that the good old tail is wagging the dog in healthcare? Yeah, that that is actually um, that's something as part of my lectures at the University of Washington that I talk about and advertising works. I mean, if you see an advertisement and you go to your doctor and you want something, they will give it to you. It doesn't matter what your condition is. If you have the condition, if you don't have the condition, they will write the prescription. That is where I think that lack of oversight and that lack of ownership on the patient, that that to me is a big problem, is a lack of patient ownership. And I know I'm going to get a lot of hate 
comments about this, but um, I live in California, so everybody's on Manjaro. Everybody, except for me, because I'm like, I'm not taking that. Are you crazy? But um, I I know so many people that are on um, type 2 diabetes medications, and I'm sure you both know that there's a shortage because of the, um, you know, it's weight loss and celebrities use it here to, you know, and I think that that is also a real, um, that's a tragedy waiting to happen because we don't have long-term data on those, on those medications. And a lot of my friends are angry with me because I tell them that and they get all frustrated because everybody here has to be really skinny. Um, so it's a, it's a conundrum because I know of dentists that are prescribing it, you know, because they're, they'll do that for their patients. And yeah. it's, yeah. it's just one of those things where that is, I think until our society embraces um, real health rather than this image of health, I, okay. I, I don't know how to describe it, but we're sicker than most countries. Our, our country is like 38 on the list of, you know, health care outcomes, positive. And we have more money and we have more treatments and we have more technology than anybody else. And yet we're not healthy. Right. And until our society starts looking at what really is health and where can we make adjustments to support health. I mean, when I was a kid, I remember there was a big push. We all got, you know, the PE was a huge deal. And we all got a presidential letter um, if you completed a certain amount of things. And it was, I was excited. I was like, oh my gosh, I got a printed letter from the president of the United States. You know, <laughs> I'm like seventh grade, I don't know. But those things are, are not, I mean, that are the number, the obesity issues are huge. And, and now the big talk is, you know, these, um, you know, Manjaro type products are great because we're going to reduce the amount of obesity and that's going to, that's going to help so many other diseases. And it's like, but you're not really addressing the problem. Right. And I think we like quick fixes here. We want instant gratification and um, we're, we're a much, you know, we're like, come on, let's go, let's go, let's do this, let's do that. Everything has to be super fast. And I yeah. think people aren't willing to take the time to, go exercise three times a week or, you know, make a healthy meal. And, and it's hard and it's expensive. I you mean, mentioned I'm that presidential people. letter, Suzanne, yeah. yes. that you received, right? That, I mean, I think that's fantastic. Because I'm not going to really say what president. I'm not going to say, because it'll <laughs> eat me even more. <laughs> it's yeah, I, I, no, no, no. I was, was going to ask you, though, when it comes to like that level, like that government level of approval, yes. Like you have to deal with regulatory bodies all the time to be able to avoid that cycle because advertising does work. We are one of only two nations. And honestly, like we're, we're the only large yeah. nation that allows this kind of advertising. Yeah. What, so that our audience understands what regulatory bodies are involved in trying to curtail advertising. So it's only limited to certain amounts of information. And then um, yeah. that changing over time to be able to keep patients from going through that cycle of, Hey, that Ozempic, I saw that advertisement the other day, and now yeah. I'm going to take that for weight loss. Right, right. So, and this is again where I think there's confusion, like, wow, I heard you can lose 10 pounds or up to 35 pounds if you take this. And it's, you know, those are the data points that they're marketing and they have to include all the other information. So that's what I deal with um, a lot of times is, you know, what information has to be provided. And so there are also there, and I always work with a lawyer as well, because there are legal implications as well, because you don't know the liability necessarily uh, if something does come out, right? right? If you do like FenFen, for example, when FenFen came out mm -hmm. and, you know, and I still have people who are angry that FenFen is off the market. It's like, well, your heart's gonna explode, honey. Yeah. Like, you mean the people that were huffing and puffing on their way to the pharmacy without even yeah. being in the steps? Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I saw a lot yeah. of that. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, you know, and and I think, I, again, I think there's unrealistic expectations of what of what health looks like. I think we really don't know. We're not being taught in school healthy eating practices, you know, how to take care of our bodies. And I know this is a complaint a lot of, you know, 
people in, I guess, uh, Gen Z, is it Gen Z? I don't even know what, that's how old I am. I don't know what generation is right now. They, you know, it's one of my kids is in that group. But um, yeah. yeah, it's like their real understanding of, because again, everything is, you know, I want to go to fast food. I want to get fast food or, you know, it's like that should be a treat, not an everyday thing. And it's just, we, none of us have time. Right. And what are the options? I mean, they're trying to make it healthier. It's like, here's a bag of apples. It's like, well, you know, kids don't want to eat mealy apples that have been in a plastic bag for, you know, a month. I don't know. It just is not, it's not right. But um, so the federal, the food and drug administration, regulates television advertising for prescription drugs only, not for supplements. Okay. So um, that is something that people also don't realize that supplements are not regulated by the FDA. So vitamins, dietary supplements, all that stuff, they only regulate the manufacturing facilities of those places. And that is, they may, if it's in a previously approved manufacturing site, then it's like, okay, good. But nobody really knows what's in supplements. You don't really know. I mean, they could have anything in there. Um, so prescription drugs are what I deal with primarily, also devices and uh, bio, uh, biotechnology products. There was an article, um, I think it was like two years ago, that that was very angry about how drugs were being advertised because they said it was a sea of same. It's so boring. There's nothing new. You, it's the same format. Everything is the same format. It's like, yeah, because it's regulated. I just wanted to call that person and be like, uh, you need to read the code of federal regulations because you're required by law to have certain statements in those ads. The ads are incredibly expensive. Um, there are millions of dollars, not only to produce, but then to also air. Um, but they're totally worth it. Like I said, if you go in and ask your doctor, hey, I saw this on TV, you know, and I want it, they'll just be like, fine, okay, get out of my office, good, next, you know, it's just, that's how it is. Um, and a lot of that is because prescribers don't have time to argue, and they don't want to lose a patient. They just, you know, so they're like, well, try and see what happens. And, you know, we'll go from there. Um, the the Federal Trade Commission also, they will get involved with unfair business practices if there's competitive statements that are uh, not correct. So that's where it starts getting into the legal side. Um, the Office of the Inspector General gets involved. There's a lot of bodies that are involved, but they don't really get involved unless there's something egregious. And so that usually comes down to a safety, safety issue. So, um, or a misrepresentation of like, nobody knows why people are sitting in a bathtub in a field. Nobody, like why? That's not egregious. We, we nobody knows why they're doing that, but <laughs> that is not something that apparently was a red flag, but nobody understands the bathtubs. Um, there are rules. <laughs> There's a lot like, of weird, weird it's famous though. Like if you're talking famous. to people about yeah. an older couple holding hands in a bathtub, like everybody has seen that commercial. In like, separate and they, they bathtub. Be, Not only one bathtub, but two. Right. They kept it kosher. You know, you gotta you gotta hold the hands in separate bathtubs. Um, but so you really broke down for us well. The first protecting protection mechanism for our patients is the FTC and the FDA for prescription yeah. drugs, so that certain information is only passed through advertising. Right. The, the next kind of level of like, how do we protect our patients or those primary care providers oftentimes, yes. how, how are they being educated so that they're protecting individuals or on the opposite side, how are they being educated so they're pushing those same exact drugs that are advertised along to their patients? Well, a lot of people believe that physicians are, you know, get kickbacks and that that's all against the law. Like that's where the FTC also comes in. You know, they're really not. Um, I think that was happening back in the day, but that that's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, so physicians are, and this is the other, I, just, I don't just look at um, like commercials. I look at all kinds of material, like slide presentations are often done. So you'll have a special, a drug company specialist come in 
and they will give you an overview quickly of the product. The problem is, is again, nobody has time, right? So you're trying to convey all this information and you have to balance it because I know you brought up the fair balance question. And that right. is the number one thing that the FDA is looking at. Whenever you talk about your product indication or what it can do for a patient, you have to balance that information with the safety because everything has benefits and risks. Nothing you ingest is without right. risk. You're always at risk if you're taking a prescription medication. So, um, or no prescription, but you're right. Yeah. yeah. Totally. And it comes very, um, that becomes challenging too because everything is so prescriptive in how we are supposed to present information. It becomes one of those things where doctors get used to hearing it and it becomes not as important anymore. Yeah. Okay. And there's a lot of study. The FDA studies this very closely. They do um, eye tracing studies where they have people come in and watch commercials and watch their eyes as they're and where where the information is being presented, how it's being presented. And they ask them questions afterward, like, well, what do you remember about this commercial? You know, what's what's this product for? what can happen if you don't take the product correctly. They do a lot of studies and they do publish their data. They have a research body that is now totally dedicated um, to researching the impact of this because people are getting more concerned. I think, you know, I don't know if it'll lead to any additional tightening of the regulations because it's gotten very free. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's very hard to manage. And the other thing is um, FDA lost several cases in federal court about free speech. Wow. And so that has crippled them from being able to manage a lot of what companies are saying because the FDA has come down on companies and said, you can't say that. And yet if they have some data to support it, it, it just be, it's become this real issue mm -hmm. and so we used to see the way the industry would kind of manage itself and rein itself in was by the amount of warning letters and notices of violations that were sent out and then, and then of course there's consent decrees and high, you know and, and huge lawsuits and and expensive um expense uh I'm not sorry my son just came home no, you're all good. F family matters matters the most. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, um, I was really curious, Donna, when it comes to like, we went through, here's the advertising regulations that Suzanne yeah. broke down for us. Here's some of the things that are being regulated to what's being presented to clinicians. Yeah. The, you know, the last line of defense that we kind of mentioned that you were doing a, a thesis on is really where's the pharmacist involvement in the whole equation? Right. Just from my limited experience, I would have pharmaceutical reps come into the hospital when I was the uh, hospital direct pharmacy director there. And they would, you know, tell me what the new drug was, break down the studies, et cetera. I'd have questions coming back related to why I'm not going to put it on formulary. And then they would go off and then try to find one of my providers at a later date. But right. when it came to coming into the pharmacy, like your experience, Donna, that you've seen and interacted with pharmaceutical reps and like the information that you've gotten previously? Yeah. Well, years ago, um, opioids and yeah. yeah, we got all of those charts and everything that people have seen, um, on any of the, um, information on the opioid, um, crisis and the movies and everything else that have come through. I've seen all those charts when I was practicing pharmacy. So yes, there was all of that. Um, I, there were probably a couple of other um, drug reps at that time, but then like kind of everybody disappeared. We weren't getting a lot of drug reps anymore. So it was kind of like never saw them, then saw them and then never saw them again. Um, so, so I think that is, you know, um, part of it, like we're saying, you know, um, Suzanne, you said, well, you know, where's the pharmacist in this education too? And, and they're like, no, 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 we don't need them. Like kind yeah. of thing. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, which is, you know, unfortunate. And um, I, I, one of the things that if you don't mind, I just backtrack on this just a little bit, because you went on to say about like, how these commercials like run a certain way, and the cost of them. And I, my mind is just blown. Like, I know that the commercials are expensive, but 
what you were saying was really mind blowing to me. I'm going, that's it. We just need commercials on deep prescribing and right. right? And well, that's you why, know, yeah. this is what that's we want to do. Days, like public service announcements. Yes. People know about the drugs, but they don't know when they're supposed to stop or when it should, you know, right. you're taking too much stuff. Like it's too yeah. much. So, and, so, and the risks are high. So. Yeah. So Suzanne, do you see at all, and I asked this and I've gotten, no, it'll never happen, but do you see at all, um, will it ever become farmer's responsibility to be like, hey, you take this med for this amount of time and then it needs to be um, evaluated, kind of like with bisphosphonates, or yes. once you reach a certain level or so many years or whatever, um, you don't see anything. I like don't see it because I mean, if you look at the the proton pump inhibitors, I talk to people about that, and they're just like, "I'm not, I'm not stopping that." <laughs> I, they get upset if I even bring it up, and I'm just like, "Okay, <laughs> you know." You again, see there's, how there's no, little, you know B12 no you have. Look at like, well, what are the things that there's no attempt to look at the underlying cause? Yeah. Until it's, it's a big crazy. enough issue for a lawsuit, like the big tobacco thing. I'd love to get your thoughts on Suzanne. Yeah. Like that's, that's one that really hit hard and Johnson and Johnson and other companies, they had to be able to pull back, add advertising, add treatment, help add a, a number of mm -hmm. things. Opiate epidemic, the exact same thing. We've seen companies literally shut their doors because of the billion dollar lawsuits that have happened. I mean, Rite Aid being one of them. What yeah. do you see in the case there with some of that proactive thinking um, for pharma, is that going to take place and have any of these issues scare them into making a pivot? No, it doesn't really scare them because most of the time the the benefit outweighs the risk. And I've worked at places where there are discussions about, well, we're not going to notify about this or we're going to continue to target these patients, even though, even though they're not our, the appropriate patient group. Um, because the sales and the profits outweigh any fine that we're going to get. Wow. And, and that, that's, I am not privy in those conversations, um, because I get kicked out of the meetings because I, I already know that I'm not going to, I'm not going to support that. I won't, because my name goes on, you know, I sign documents that go to the FDA. So if I'm signing, I better believe in it. If yeah. I, you know, I better be able to stand up for it. And I'm not going to stand up for something like that. That's totally against my moral code. But um, again, this is this is a society where, you know, money talks. And I mean, if you look at the Sackler family, that's a blip. What they got charged and how many people, and I'll say that in public, Sackler family, um, <laughs> you know, I they were willing to do that. And they didn't, they, yeah, they got charged like three or $6 billion, but they have $60 billion or whatever it is. I don't, those are not exact numbers, but it's a blip. It's a tiny percentage of their overall wealth. And they just moved to Europe where people don't know them and they're fine. Like they still, you know, so I, I, I don't think it detracts enough. Um, I've worked at companies that have had consent decrees and things like that, where it's really not fun. Um, cause you have, uh, you know, regulatory authorities breathing down your neck constantly. I I've never been at a company where it's happened while I've been there. Um, but I've been at companies after they've gotten a consent degree and which makes it somewhat easier for me because I'm just like, Oh, remember that consent degree that you had? I think we need to, you know, we need to play properly here, but, um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't diminish what they're doing. Definitely. And, and again, at the end of the day, I would say the majority of pharma is trying to do the right thing. It's always a <laughs> few bad players that ruin it for everybody. Sure. You know, and that's really unfortunate because again, I'm not anti pharma. I'm just, you know, and, and again, our lobbying, um, the lobbying at in, in, uh, in DC is, is huge. And, that's I, I think it's hard to to go against that. I mean, that is I mean, the AMA is one of the largest, you know, preventers of pharmacists becoming health care providers because they lobbied against it successfully many times. So, again, lobbying in our in our government 
that's 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 tough to beat. Don, did you a ton of bricks when you just heard Suzanne make some of those statements right there? Well aware. Um, yeah, I get so many hate comments. Ah. <laughs> It's, it's just because we're, we're talked in, and we teach about, right. um, you know, interprofessional education and working in teams. And, and once you get into the teams, they're, you know, people are like, oh, wow, that's great. And, and, you know, there's great exchange and everything else. But I don't understand why, you know, if you take it to a bigger picture, like, why is it that, oh, no you know, but you just talked to a pharmacist that, you know, found an interaction or found why this person was hospitalized or whatever. So, so why isn't that important to you? <laughs> and why are we like moving this forward? It, and I feel like we've been saying the same thing for my entire pharmacy career. I think, I think a big problem is that, um, you know, this, these issues are new to me, but they're not like surprising. Um, and I think what needs to happen again is there just needs to be more education out there about this topic. And I applaud you for your book and for your work in, on this, because every time I bring it up to someone, they're like, oh, I totally know what you mean. Like my mom or my friend or my grandma or my aunt. You know, she was on this and she fell and, you know, and broke her hip. And then they found out it was the meds. I mean, it happened to my own mother-in-law. She mm -hmm. had a side effect from a medication given to her in the hospital. Um, she was diabetic, went in for a, a hypoglycemic issue, was discharged, and two weeks later couldn't walk anymore. I'm like, what is going on? This is a woman who did yoga every day and was a vegetarian. So for in two weeks, she couldn't walk. And everybody just said, oh, she's just, you know, she's elderly, elderly. Right. Right. I'm like, um, she is a badass yoga, you know, vegetarian. Like I, she can probably, you know, pretzel herself into <laughs> oblivion in a way that I could never do. So just because she's older doesn't mean she's not capable, right. you know? And sure. so we finally had somebody come in. Um, it was a prescriber, um, a, a, a diabetes uh, endocrinologist diabetes expert and he said well she's on this where did she get this she doesn't need this and we're like we don't know so we had to go back and try to figure it out but um we got her off of that medication and she was back to walking normal in like a week wow. and again it's it's one of those things where but she was on a lot of medication so it was hard like i didn't know all the things she was on and and i trusted the doctors I, you know, I don't, I just knew something was wrong. And I think we also have to question and, and be advocates. Yeah. I, I love that you're advocating for that uncoupling, right. Of pharmacists from pharmaceutical products, right. In ways that they can now be those caretakers at the end of the rope, uh, right before it gets to those patients to make sure that they're staying safe and they're doing right. that more comprehensive evaluation because that yeah. it's, an, it's an interesting it's an interesting conflict that a lot of us have been dealing with for a long time that that manufacturer product coming across and those margins going into the pockets of pharmacists and pharmacy owners that's how they're feeding their families and so mm -hmm. having that element of payment as opposed to paying for truly keeping patients safe mm -hmm. um, is an interesting conflict that i don't think a lot of people like to admit to and it does distance pharmacists from patients you're right suzanne and right. some so really appreciate the work that you're doing yeah well that it's the difference between a product and a service, mm -hmm. are you Absolutely. Getting paid for, right? Are you getting paid for the product or are you getting paid for the service? And I think the mm -hmm. focus has just been on the product right. and, oh. and it's really the service is the knowledge transfer. Right. So no, I totally exactly. Agree. And we all need to be med strong because I'm just going to say it because Suzanne, you brought it up too, but honestly, it's so, it's so important that, you know, we're not just perpetuating this and that we're taking the steps. I can't thank you enough for the education you provided um, to me tonight. And I'm sure countless others that have been listening in, in regards to, um, you know, just really enlightening us on the give and take, if you will, um, of where pharmacists need to be and um, industry, et cetera, the, the whole healthcare system. So thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah. Thank, thank you so you much, Suzanne.
Awesome. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really honored to have been a part of this today. So thank you again. Yeah. Fantastic. Really appreciate you. Thank you everyone for listening. Uh, if we don't talk to you before then, have a wonderful Christmas and we will talk to you then again soon. Have a good rest of the night. Wow. Wow. <laughs>